I was tempted to start out by saying that, well, it was obvious that Terry had not finished his uh, answer to the second question, and I was going to offer him some more time. Uh, but uh, I'm not <clears throat> serious about that. <laughs> At any event, uh, let's get to the first question. With regard to breaking of bread, does Acts 2.46 contradict Acts 20, verse 7? And the simple answer to that is no. And now, now for the second question. Uh, I know what they're getting at. This is a question that's popped up several times on some of the discussion lists, and always pretty much by the same people. Uh, you can just about count on them raising it up. Uh, it's been answered before, but I don't know if they're, if they're the ones that ask it uh, on this occasion. But uh, in Acts 2, verse uh, 42, the text says, And they continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, and the breaking of bread, and in prayers. There we have a mention of the breaking of, uh, of bread, but there's a key thing here in the Greek text that is uh, called the article. Uh, in English, we refer to it as the definite article, but the Greek has no indefinite article, and so they just refer to it as the article. And so it is two or two. Then down in verse 46, we have, uh, so continuing uh, daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread, from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, or singleness of heart. Uh, here, there is no definite article. There is no article in the uh, Greek text. It is simply breaking bread. Now, the Greek article is technically a pointer. It is used to demonstrate or to point to something that originally was a, de a demonstrative pronoun, or used like a demonstrative pronoun, but uh, it points to something in a definite sense. Now, definiteness can be established by other means. We're going to say more about that in just a moment. But in Acts 2.42, we are dealing with something that is definite, that is in connection with the apostles' doctrine or teaching, Fellowship, that is the koinonia, and referring to the giving of means uh, specifically here, and in prayers. These are articles of worship, items of worship. And uh, so we're dealing with the Lord's Supper, and so that has been understood for almost 2,000 years, or about 2,000 years. Uh, the... Uh, only in very recent years has people begun to say or suggest that this is a common meal. And uh, simply on the basis of their own assertion. They simply assert it's a common meal and so it's supposed to be. But keep in mind it's in connection with other items of worship. And uh, that uh, and the use of the article, we're dealing with the Lord's Supper in verse 42. But the absence of the article in verse 46 shows contrast. When you have in text that uh, in the same context where you have uh, the article used and then the article is dropped, utilizing the same noun many times, in fact most of the cases it involves a contrast. And that's what we have here. In verse 46 we're just talking about a common meal. And so they ate their common meals from house to house, had fellowship meals with one another, and uh, fellowship with one another and encouraged one another in the process. And that's Acts 2. Now in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, what we have is a uh, text, uh, verse 7, that deals first and foremost with a regular practice that was observed by the church at Troas. Setting the background of this text, keep in mind that Paul was uh, traveling en route with his companions to the city of Jerusalem. He wanted to be there, desired to be there by Pentecost. He was in a hurry to get there, in fact. And uh, yet he tarried a full week, seven days, 
so he could meet with the brethren who uh, gathered, according to Acts 20, verse 7, on the first day of the week, uh, to break bread. Someone says, aha, there's no article there. Certainly there's no article. It's not needed. The Greek uses the article for, definite, for definiteness, certainly. But that's not the only way that definiteness can be established in the Greek text. Many uh, various uh, grammatical forms or structures are used for definiteness. Uh, in fact, there are about 13 or 14 that I know of specifically. But one of the things that we have here that shows we're de dealing with definiteness is context. And that is the way in which, uh, one way in which definiteness is uh, demonstrated. And so we're talking about coming together to eat the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, even though the article is lacking. This passage actually parallels Acts 2, verse 42, not Acts 2, 46. Now keep this in mind. If this were a common meal, then Paul could have had them meet any day, not have to wait seven full days uh, in order to uh, meet with them. He could have ordered it the day he arrived. He could have ordered it the next day or two or three days later. So he would have been well on his way to the city of Jerusalem by the time of Pentecost. But he tarried. He stopped. And he waited. Why? Because this was the day in which they observed the Lord's Supper. Uh, in fact, I discussed this in more detail in the material on Bible authority. And I recommend you read that section uh, under the uh, uh, heading of example, dealing with that in a little more detail. So, no, it does not contradict. It's in perfect harmony. And uh, as I said, it's only in recent years that this idea that Acts 20 verse 7 is a common meal and Acts uh, 2 verse 42 is a common meal has even cropped up. And uh, the people that have suggested that uh, didn't have the purest of motives in the process. Well, we'll open it up for discussion to the floor. Any comments, questions? Stick your tongue out. Kiss my foot. All right. Second question. Is it sinful to work at a place where they sell alcohol? Like a grocery store, this is an example. Like a restaurant, especially if you have to serve the alcohol to people. Then there's a follow-up. Would it be sinful to be a patron of these types of places? Buy groceries at a place that also sells alcohol, eat at a place where they serve it. Let me ask this. Where do you buy your gas? Gas stations also sell alcohol. If one is going to contend that it is an absolute sin to purchase uh, your groceries at a place that sells alcohol, what about cigarettes? There are places I know of that sell cigarettes, but not necessarily alcohol. But most of the places I know of now sell both. And that includes the gas station. So where would one get the petrol, as they say in England, that's needed to be able to get them from one place to the next, to even get them to attend service? Uh, no, if one would not necessarily sin in uh, buying uh, groceries from a place that sells uh, alcohol or eating at such an establishment. Now, uh, there was a point that Brother uh, Mouth of the South made, uh, <laughs> Brother Hightower, uh, and uh, it's an excellent point. And he has made several excellent points, by the way, dealing with this logic. But he made the, the uh, point that some things are, uh, may not be innately evil, 
but they can be evil under certain circumstances or conditions. Uh, for example, if you are dealing with a place that uh, uh, sells alcohol and uh, let, let's just say uh, uh, also uh, has a jiggle show associated with it, like uh, uh, Hooters, uh, that involves a, uh, an aspect of one's influence that is destructive. And so you have to take that into consideration. I would contend it'd be a sin to eat at Hooters because of the very nature of the place, of what it seeks to publicly, uh, how it presents itself, how it advertises itself. Uh, the same at any gentleman's bar or gentleman's establishment or something of that nature would be sinful. Uh, the, all sorts of things like that, just from the influence standpoint, would be evil. Uh, you'd have to avoid it. Uh, but say there's a big difference between Hooters and, say, uh, Pizza Hut. Pizza Hut serves beer. Uh, could a Christian work at Pizza Hut? Think about that. Could a Christian work at uh, Waffle House? Well, we'd say yes. But uh, places like Waffle House have endorsed the homosexual agenda. Now, where are we going to draw the line on that? If you have a company that has endorsed the homosexual movement or is involved in uh, other activities, uh, such as a lot of the companies up in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, they have the uh, yearly uh, gay pride softball tournament up there. And a lot of the companies are advertising in association with that operation. Are all Christians working for those companies, therefore, in sin? Home Depot. Home Depot. What about Home Depot? Could you buy, would it be an absolute sin to purchase a hammer at Home Depot? Where are you going to draw the line? I think you'll eventually find yourself sitting at home wondering where in the world you're going to go and what you're going to do and where, where you're going to buy anything if you take this to the extreme. Uh, there is some judgment that is involved here. I think there's a principle that we're dealing with in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, same principle that uh, the Lord deals with in Luke chapter 17 in his prayer, or John 17, concerning we're in the world, but not of the world. Uh, we can't cut ourselves completely off from these things. That would be an impossibility. The only way you could do that is to leave this world. And uh, that principle I'm talking about is also found in 1 Corinthians 5. He said in verse 9, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people, yet I, that is fornicators, yet I certainly did not mean with the, with the fornicating, uh, fornicators of this world or with the covetous, or extortioners, or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. He recognized that there are certain limits to this, that it would be impossible to totally cut ourselves off from this type of behavior or these type of, of people. And I think uh, that underlying principles involved here. Uh, comment. David Brown Spring, Texas. Could this church, with the authority of the New Testament, decide to sell the grounds and buildings to some denominational church? Is there New Testament authority for doing that? Well, certainly there is. It's a business transaction. And that's all it is. Now, you might have your preferences. Mm -hmm. I'd rather sell it to a denomination than to an atheistic group. But that's a matter of preferences and and uh, that can't be bound on other people. 
Uh, we've done that kind of thing for years. I haven't heard anybody say, uh, relative to the church organizations that operate hospitals, that if I'm dying of something, that be sure and drive me 20 miles further that way because I don't want to go to the Catholic hospital. It's right around the corner. Uh, well, your state of affairs doesn't determine whether it's authorized or not in the matter. And you could go on that way to the point, I think Daniel Wells said it, you just wouldn't be doing anything. Uh, but I do want to emphasize this. And I think it's a guideline the Scripture set out. Circumstances alter cases. Now, what do I mean by that? Circumstances alter cases. I mean there can be some sort of, let's say, fjord where the attention of everybody is focused on something. And it might mean that I just as a Christian rather not be involved in that right now because it is that way, and yet it really is doing no more than what several other organizations are over here. You see that in Paul's discussion about eating meat off of the idols. Mm -hmm. He plainly says the Christian knows there's nothing to the idol, and certainly therefore nothing to the thing offered the idol. Well, what is he teaching? No man liveth to himself, no man dieth to himself. I have to sit, I have to consider those who they don't have that knowledge that I have. So all of these principles come to bear. It's just like saying all things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. We usually use that to say, see, if it's lawful, we can do it. Paul didn't say that. He said, once you determine a thing is authorized by the New Testament, you still got to determine whether it is expeditious for you to engage in it. So that comes to bear upon the matter. And that's what elders, a lot of what elders do in a congregation is from that perspective. So some things at times, yes, you might just go right ahead and do it. Uh, other times in the matter of what we're talking about, you might have to pull back due to what's going on at that particular time. Uh, we have a fellow in the congregation whose father was a child in the Netherlands during the uh, Nazi occupation. They were not Jews. But his grandfather wanted, had enough courage, I guess that's a good way to put it, where he made all their kids wear the Star of David on their, on their arm, though they weren't Jews, just to show them we're not going to knuckle down to this stuff and we're not going to abide by your laws concerning the Jews. Well, that was their decision to do that, one way or the other. But I couldn't turn around and say, everybody else got to do it too, or you're, you don't have any courage. There are a lot of things like that in the Christian life, and this has caused all sorts of problems in the church because people will not realize is it authorized in the sense that it's obligatory or is it authorized in the sense that it may be done but it may not be done and until that gets well thought out then we're a long way off from being able to have peace and unity that the new testament teaches we ought to have mm -hmm. we had a family that ab that insisted it was an absolute sin to uh, buy your groceries from uh, a place that sold alcohol uh, uh, until the last grocery store introduced alcohol. And they decided they were more addicted to eating uh, than they were their doctor. <laughs> hey Moses, Mammoth Spring, Arkansas. Appreciate the comments made about uh, intrinsic or innate sin with regard to these things. <clears throat> but at the same point, we think about what was said with regard to Lot and how after he, though he pitched his tent towards Sodom, we're told that he was uh, continually vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Uh, we should still be of the attitude and mindset that we are vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked and we want to be sure that we're not go to the point of where we're going along with it. We want to still have the attitude of the psalmist who didn't want to set any wicked thing before his eyes. Absolutely. Uh, and so we want, at the same time, we realize that maybe we're not pitching our tent toward Sodom, but Sodom is increasingly pitching its tent toward us. Uh, that while we understand that to an extent we're going to have to be in the world, uh, that we do make sure to keep that distinction from being uh, that we continue to become of the world. I'm not sure who I am at this point in time. That like, uh, <laughs> I'm Michael Hatcher from Bellevue. Isn't a great deal of this as to what you're saying in relationship to a place of business, the thrust of the business? Oh, definitely. If the business, for example, is a restaurant and the thrust of it is 
the aspect of serving food, but in the aspect of serving food, they serve alcohol. Mm -hmm. As opposed to a place that's a bar. Definitely. That might also serve food. Mm -hmm. The thrust of the two are quite different. Where it might be wrong, so as it work in the bar, it might be all right to work in the restaurant mm -hmm. that might serve the alcohol, even if you have to serve the alcohol to individuals who request it. Yeah. Would that not be the case? I would contend so. Uh, even there are situations that come up where we'll be go out to eat, and uh, we pay attention to the way in which even a restaurant, and I'm talking about a legitimate eating place, will package itself to the community. If you go out and the, the beer signs and the wine signs are in great bright neon and they're, they're very prominent and stuff like that, we don't eat at those places. There are at least still enough places that don't do that. Uh, to uh, forego uh, and part of that is to set an example for those about us we did that concerning our children uh, we do that concerning the one that is still at home Megan and uh, and for brothers and sisters in Christ as well as those that we're trying to teach trying to influence we're going to take someone out to eat uh, you know here you are working with someone and you pull up at a place that the, the, the first thing that strikes, the, strikes your eyes is a great big neon sign, booze. Uh, what kind of influence is that for the cause of Christ? And so, uh, again, as uh, David said, circumstances uh, alter. How do you phrase that? I, I've heard you say that so many times. Alter cases. That's an excellent way to phrase it. Uh, but, uh, and this is a circumstance that alters the case in point. And we'll just go on down to the next place or whatever. Brother Dan. Oh, uh, another in association with this? or oh, oh, another subject. Okay. Well, you might not get in it. <laughs> go on ahead. Bring it up. So. <laughs> Danny Douglas, Central Church of Christ, Mount Pleasant, Tennessee. I uh, appreciate uh, Brother Brown's lesson of the last hour on parachurch organization. Well, Church of Christ is asked to relief effort, Inc. Incorporated. Uh, the thing that, and I agree, I appreciate what he said, the thing that I have been emphasizing about such organizations is that they are parachurch organizations. Of course, the name is unscriptural, uh, but they are circumventing the work that God gave the church to do. And, uh, and I'm, I'm not saying that he didn't include that idea uh, altogether in his book, but I am saying that that's my understanding of it. And uh, if I'm wrong about that, please let me know. I believe that uh, those organizations, uh, if congregations give their funds over to them, they forfeit their autonomy regarding that particular work. And therefore, that's one of the things that make these extra organizations parachurch organizations. And I do appreciate, again, Brother Brown's good lesson, but would you like to comment on that? One of my biggest concerns concerning uh, the disaster relief, and for that matter, the same principle applies to lads to leaders. Uh, and David uh, does touch on this, deal with this, and, and uh, concerning their uh, fellowship practices. And I believe that definitely, if there's any discussion on the other aspect of whether they undermine the local congregation's autonomy and situation, this definitely does because it forces you in the fellowship with individuals and with congregations that you have no right to fellowship. 
uh, give you a case in point. We in the Newport News, Virginia area, had withdrawn from five specific congregations uh, from well docu on well-documented basis from their false teaching and practices, their fellowship of various false teachers, including Ruba Shelley, uh, Joe Beam, or Joe Off the Beam, and a, a host of other false teachers that they were endorsing and, and uh, uh, participating with. Uh, the, one of those congregations has now adopted lads to leaders. Now suppose the Newport News congregation had had a lads to leaders program. In effect, our young people and those working with them would be in fellowship with the, this specific congregation that was marked and duly withdrawn from in other venues, such as if they had something down in Atlanta or whatever, or uh, they would be in fellowship with them, even though we had properly marked them for their false practices and teaching. That would undermine our autonomy as far as, uh, uh, and undermine what we were doing as far as trying to uh, bring said congregation to repentance and restore them to Christ. In similar fashion, uh, the disaster relief takes no notice as to uh, the doctrinal stance, practices, and so on of the congregations they work with. In fact, they specifically state that. They're not going to get involved in what they uh, term brotherhood politics. Well, excuse me, but uh, the, we have no right to fellowship certain people and to be involved with uh, these uh, efforts like that. Uh, would lead us into a compromising situation. Now you may have somebody on the bubble you're working with and so on, but if you are dealing with a known false teacher, false doctrine or something like that, and these type of situations come up, uh, you need to, to uh, stay away from that type of stuff. Brother Dave. David Brown, Spring, Texas. The reason I chose the route I did in, in putting that material together because there's a lot more to be said about it, is that we recognize that each Christian, and nothing else, Galatians 6 and uh, verse 10, each Christian has an obligation regardless of what the church does when opportunity avails itself on Monday or Friday or Thursday or whatever to take care of, of, of somebody in need. So the reason I approached it from that angle is that if one, I'll use me for example, if I have that authority from Christ, the individual Christian on Tuesday, to help a family whose house burned down, then two of us do, and three of us do. And if you have four or five people here who have a lot of money, very wealthy, and they want to get together and do things like this, I'm not saying rob it from the church, some people say, well, yeah, I'll give to it, and then we'll give it to the church on Sunday. Well, there's no authority to do that either. Mm -hmm. Then what we're trying to say is the money you give to the church, which you're obligated to do because it's authorized, is one thing, but you, you can't say on Tuesday, well, I've already given at the church. I don't have to help you. I'm trying to approach it from the standpoint of if one has authority, two has authority, three has authority, and those three or four can, can do that. I don't know of a thing in the Bible that say that's not authorized. I don't know of a thing in the Bible that forbids it. What I'm trying to say about attaching Church of Christ to that is that because that is a term that designates the realm of the saved and, and connects it to he who saved it and vice versa, you can't just stick that to some organization. Because when you put that name on there, names have meanings, you have invented a whole other organization that is just not authorized. Mm -hmm. It's not just sticking a name on it. Mm -hmm. That's a descriptive term, and it can't be applied to what I said up here at all. Yet individuals have authority from God on Tuesday or Friday to help anybody that has need, as long as all other things are scripturally equal. And that's the reason I approached it in that angle. Now, the missionary society back in the 19th century certainly usurped the church because the church is the only institution that is authorized by the New Testament to preach the gospel to every creature. 
Now, when they put the missionary society over here doing that, then they took away from the churches the responsibility that God only gave the church because they were supporting, and that was the whole reason they did what they did. They were supporting preaching the gospel through that missionary society. The whole society was wrong. But the group, as I've described it, would not be necessarily contrary to the authority of Christ in benevolent works. Could be, but it's not necessary. Yeah. Yes. Yes, sir. Right. And that's, that's the reason it has become. That's the reason you cannot apply churches of Christ to it because the scriptures teach that applies only to one institution. Mm -hmm. That's what it's here, sir. One of the, uh, and my point concerning the fellowship issue is that they are in effect setting themselves up in such a way that they can negate the actions and operations of congregations scripturally withdrawing from other churches and say we, we, we can just plow over that and the work through whoever we want to regardless uh, of, of what you think about it. And uh, that attitude is uh, deplorable. Michael Hatcher from Bellevue. David, in your illustration of I have the opportunity or several of us together getting together, getting an organization even, we have the authority to do that. The question then comes, does, say, uh, there's a disaster over here, and I, this, con this organization then come in and take over what the church is to do in relationship to the benevolent action. That just changes the whole thing. I mean, if you go define it that way, then I'll kick the whole thing out. This is the reason it's important to define your terms. Uh, if we, let, let's just say we, we three of I think that's what he's talking about. I'm not trying to argue with Danny. I just wanted to come up and say, here is why I approached it the way I did. The difference between an individual Christian doing things or several of them doing things and the church authorized to do something. I want to give those yeah. aspects. Okay. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. And let me emphasize again for anybody that gets the book, I deal with that business of fellowship very much. In yes. there. I just didn't get all I, of it. I saw it. it. It's an excellent and, uh, here. There's a lot to be thought of when it comes to something like that. And as I told whoever, I think it was Lee, you see something in there in my thinking that's incorrect or not logical or scripture is not used or some way used wrongly, I don't mind being told about it. Uh, I'm just not one of those that, that feels that way about that. Well, Terry Hightower from Amarillo, Texas. I just wanted to respond to what Danny has brought up and at least give a little caution here uh, for us at least to think about. And in logic, of course, definitions are crucial. And Danny, that parachurch organization phrase, what does that mean? You're going to have to define it. You're going to have to define it in such a way so that at least I would say there are some of our schools of preaching, for instance, the Florida School of Preaching, which is set up under a board of directors, and not an eldership. Is that a parachurch organization? Is, uh, is maybe, uh, the, I think, the Nashville Bible Institute, it was set up and not under an eldership, wasn't it? I believe. So I'm just saying it's not that that proves it's right because there is one. You can't prove an, an alt from an is. We know that. But... Uh, you can't prove it just from history, but, but are they authorized or are they included in your definition of a parachurch organization? What about our colleges and universities that until they've gone apostate, you know, we traditionally have uh, upheld that colleges run by brethren and under a board of directors. Is that school then because they teach Bible and have a Bible, well, they used to have Bible departments, uh, uh, maybe a theology department, does yeah. that automatically mean yeah. they're out the door because they're a parachurch organization? You're going to have to define parachurch, you know, uh, for me. And then I just add in that some things, it's like uh, I can hook in just about nearly any job you want to come up with. I've had to do that a few times with a few individuals. I used to think I could tell every job and exactly what, I can tell you what I would do, but I, don't, I finally saw I couldn't decide it. For instance, can you be a GTE or Bell telephone installer and install a telephone in a denominational building? Or are you doing wrong? And they're going to use that to teach error. So, yeah.
Uh, what about, you know, in an atheist individual home, and I go install his phone for him, set him up so he can talk atheism over the telephone or whatever, his computer, internet, whatever. You, I'm just saying, like signs, I know an individual that put the lights on signs out here in the Bay Area. He was a Christian member of the church, but long about Christmas time, those lights of the signs that he was putting, the bulbs, all he did was the electricity part of it and the lights so they'd glow. You know, you could see them at night. And they'd put up their Seagram 7 and the booze, the beer, the whiskey. And as he now hung into that, and that's what I mean, you want to yeah. really think it out. Need to think through it. That's right. So, uh, but I might just kind of counter. I, you brought up some things, Brother Hightower, that just had me wondering. Uh, to, technically, you talk about the colleges, and they've historically justified themselves as being extensions of the home. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. Uh, and so at least they find some type of justification in that sense. Uh, so how would you explain then a, a school of preaching under a board of directors and not under in ownership? Some of these institutions... You're buying services like you buy from anything else going to college. That makes it sense. Wait, Terry. Oh, yep, you have to come up here. You remember, it has to be recorded. It's being recorded and going out over the Internet. Terry, Terry Hightower, I'm real Texas again. I think there's a difference there in that you are, are buying a service and we're, the church can train preachers, but there's no details about how that has to be done so that you can buy a service here of a school. You could send some uh, young men uh, to be trained in certain ways, I think, and pay for their college course at a ju local junior college. And if you can do that, that's what we're saying about a Christian college. We use the word Christian. Maybe it is kind of a misnomer headed towards what David has pointed out about the name of the churches of Christ, you know, like that. Well, sometimes you'll say Church of Christ College or University. Well, there you are, David. You know, is that going to be all right or not? Maybe Florida College had the right idea and took the word Christian out. <laughs> but anyway, it's where uh, there's set up what you're doing is just fulfilling the verses about, uh, you know, uh, teaching uh, persons who will then in turn teach others, or even under the Great Commission of Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and you're buying a service. I was going to bring up another one for you to think about. Uh, several of us, and I know Brother Warren for sure was involved in this, and some are members of some theological uh, entities or groups. Is that a parachurch, Danny? Is that a parachurch organization? To be a member of the Evangelical Theological Association. Or like Brother Warren was in, the, the philosophy, the philosophy thing. I look at that like he mentioned about a business. Uh, it's a business deal there like on installing that telephone uh, or some things that, that Daniel mentioned. Uh, but what about some of those uh, quasi para, quasi religious things that we might be, you know, uh, part of? And it's a little more difficult to define and then to eliminate this, but to still keep this practice or, or what. And again, I'll just use a personal illustration again. It's Disney World. I quit going to Disney World, even though some of the members of my own immediate family will still go. Terry's not going because of what they did concerning the homosexual movement and that they gave uh, rights to these people who were... Uh, uh, lesbians or homosexuals, but they did not give the rights to a heterosexual couple who were just living together. Well, that was my break point right there. And if you want to take your kids and go, fine. I'm not going to try to bind my view of you on, any more than I will on my family. But some things will have to be thought out and decided, I'm just saying, on an individual basis, I think, and not impose your, you know, uh, morality in a sense then in a wrong sense I believe on to someone else David Brown Spring Paul caught in the school of Tyrannus is that right the apostle of Jesus Christ what else was taught in the school of Tyrannus don't know was it set up strictly to for Paul to teach in other rooms of the church that's basically what it was now, could you take money out of the church treasury and send your students to study with Paul for two years as he taught in the school of training? Is there authority in the New Testament to do that? 
then you had admitted a whole lot when you said it. You just have to think the implications of what you said. That's the reason I said a while ago, circumstances alter cases. If Hymenaeus was teaching in the school of Tyrannus, it'd be a different story, wouldn't it? Now, you, get, you know, those words aren't in the Bible just to take up space. When that's in the Bible, God anticipated every error that would ever come up between the time the Bible was written in the world. And there's one thing that helps us on this business of what to do and who we support and where they are. We just don't, we read through it so fast, it becomes a historical statement, we don't realize what's said there. So that's all I'm saying is add that into the thinking apparatus of determining these things. I know it's about time to go, but uh, the word para means to put beside of. And that's, maybe I should define that, but uh, uh, my understanding that the uh, organization like CCDR Incorporated are parallel to American Missionaries Society. Uh, now, you know, again, I'm like Brother Brown. If there's a mistake in my thinking on that, I want to know. Because when the church gives us money over to CCDRE Incorporated to do their benevolent work, then they're letting this organization do what God ordained the church to do. Uh, the church is all sufficient to do all that God ordained for it to do. Mission work, edification, and benevolence. Now, if there is another organization that can do a better job, is that not a parachurch organization? And is it not a parallel to the American Missionary Society? Now, if your brethren want to discuss that, I believe it is. But uh, As concerns the uh, uh, preacher training school, uh, under an eldership or under a, a board of trustees that is serving as an aid to accomplish a purpose that the local congregation does have. So there is an intersection of interest and in, in mutual work there. That there, and it is a purchase of service. The church is ordained of God to do things that only it is to do. Yeah. There are members of the church, or there wouldn't be a church. Collectively so, then there are members. The church collective is run different from the individual Christian. The elders are over the church. They're the husband of the house. You're over your home. And Galatians 6.10 has a bearing on individual activity, not just the giving on the first day of the week, which we do as a worship, uh, part of the worship in, 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 in the first day of the week assembly. So it doesn't cover all that I can do individually to help somebody in a benevolent case or to teach the gospel. If I'm teaching... If I start teaching somewhere and a couple of people come to study with me and over a period of years, I've got five or six people coming all the time and it's costing me money and they say, we'll help you. Here, we'll give you uh, $20 a week to do this. And now, you know, if you don't watch out, you will define that out to be by the way I just described it, to be something that's a parachurch organization. And that's what, why our definition is so important. I'm far more in harmony with you than you might think. In fact, I think we all are in harmony with you. But I, church fund, well, could the church support me to teach this class on the Bible at, out of my house? Out of the church treasury? Could it? Am I, would I constitute a parachurch organization? They're giving me the duty to teach what I'm teaching in that class when I teach it, and they're paying me to do it. In fact, I just described the gospel preacher. <laughs> the microphone. Stay up in the mic. <laughs> Both of you. Well, you can have this side and I'll have this side. <laughs> oh, the difference? Well, when you look at... Now, you all help me on this, but when you look at the missionary society... They intended to set up an organization by which the church would contribute the money to them. We will select the men and we will send them out. And when you've done that, you've fulfilled your obligation to do that. That took it out from under any elders. It took it out from under the church. And it said, we give our money to you to do as you please in the preaching of the gospel. That's a far cry different from supporting me as a preacher over here in my house, whether it's in the same city or halfway around the world. And then next thing you know, we got two or three preachers there, and we're operating a school, and individuals and others. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's my Well, whether it's... Who chooses the benevolent work that the Church of Christ is asked to lead to? Oh, well, I understand that. I'm not arguing for them. I'm not saying that. 
they choose what they're going to choose. They're going to go where they choose to go. So I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not defending what they do. What I am trying to say is, is we're not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Because that's a good old attitude of saying, well, if we get rid of all of it, we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> yeah, we're, trying to define, we're just trying to define it down to make sure what's wrong and what's right. And not just lump it all together and say, we don't have to worry about that, we just kick it all out. Yeah, certainly. I was addressing specifically the, the Church of Christ is asked for relief. I'm not talking about church funding you individually to teach class. That's exactly what I was talking about. I wasn't talking about these other things. So, please. Well, I, I understand that. But what I'm saying. Yeah. That's what it is, in my view. Okay, so all parachurch organizations are wrong. See, that's what you got to be careful of. Well, it's certain. Okay. You can't do a blanket thing unless you're going to go ahead and go like you said. That's a problem of writing precisely stated propositions. You're going to have to stay at the microphone because you got to remember this is going out over the internet and it is being recorded for others to view. So you need to stay at the microphone if you're going to There's make There's still comments. room right here, Terry. Um, <laughs> I'm saying that the organizations like Church Christ and National Relief Effort Incorporated are, fair, are unscriptural fair church organizations. Now, if I'm mistaken with that, yeah. No, please let me know. Well, my whole chapter. Because I've been preaching against my whole chapter. My whole chapter is against that one particular thing. Okay. But you notice that I did try to find things as best I could with where we are in the limited space I had, so that people would, brethren, lump things in. They hear you say something, and they just say they put it all in together. And we but must we, all we must avoid that. buzzwords. Yeah, and go back to what I, go back to what buzzword. I presented on the AEIO type statements, and that's exactly what's at issue here is all you just actually said some, which he and I and probably everybody in here agree with you on, because you just said the one, this one pair of church organization. That's only some. In fact, it's only one, but it's still some. It's not all. And we would say, wait a minute. If you say all, I'm going to disagree with you then about that. Let me, okay. give, let me give you an example. Well, maybe then I, I was not consistent then, but the pair of church organization may be scriptural. That's what you're saying. When we were debating the Andes on orphan songs and the definitions that they would make when they would start out, like Brother Woods and others, they would say uh, an orphan's home like Bowles' home. And what we did when we dealt with the reevaluation and reaffirmation of elders, we would say, as done by the Brown Trail School of Preaching, or rather the church, at such and such a time. Because that's the way you've got to limit it to the one you're talking about that you know is wrong. And that's all I'm saying. Okay. Yeah, I agree with Brother Brown's message. He has a good lesson. Okay. okay. Uh, in this, and here's the, the problem to sum it up. When we make a blanket statement of all parachurch organizations, then we fall into problems is the CCDR, I have the acronym right, an organization that is unscriptural? Yes. Why? Because of the aspects that they are, make them unscriptural. Just to say anything that is beside the church, that's, yes, might be doing the work that the church also does, doesn't make it wrong, though. And that's, it's, it can be a church. <laughs> it can be assisting the work of the church. It can be doing its own work and the church using it and buying a service from it. Uh, thus, a blanket statement that all parachurch organizations would be wrong, that's a wrong statement. Some of them can be wrong, yes but you have to look at each one separately as to whether or not it is right or whether it is wrong. Or a World Video Bible School. Uh, World Video Bible School. That would be a good illustration of the work. But, right. We're talking about the, the, the type of organization that it is in getting people to record Bible messages, sending those messages out, those classes out, 
Well, that's a work that the church also does in teaching and edifying. Is it thus? It's not the church. It's not under the oversight of an eldership. Is it a parachurch organization in that sense? Well, yes, it is. Is it unscriptural? I don't see anything in which it would be unscriptural. You have certain brethren who have gotten together and who have decided we're going to do this work. Now, can the church buy a service from them in buying those tapes? Certainly. They can support those individuals who are engaged in it. Now, and again, when we're talking about that organization, World Video Bible School, we're not talking about who they're having or anything like that. We're talking about the concept. Same thing with the school of preaching. Same thing with a disaster relief organization, not specifically CCDR. Again, you have to look at each one individually without making a blanket statement. And then the last thing. As concerns the Missionary Society, it had no inherent right of itself to exist and because of its very nature. Plus, did not it then go back and dictate to the churches as to what they were going to do? Well, that's in effect what the, they're doing on the... That's in effect what CCD. the uh, CC DR is do, DRE <laughs> does concerning the nature of fellowship. It's saying that we are going to place you in fellowship with people that you're out of fellowship, whether you like it or not, if you participate with us. So, in that respect, in that, in that, that respect, it would be. In that respect. But that does not mean that all of these organizations necessarily would be. So, again, you look at each individual group or organization as it is, and not a, just simply a blanket statement of they are all sinful. Okay, appreciate all of the comments. We went over time a little bit.